people don't buy because something's like nice to have they buy it because they need to have it to solve a problem i need to be able to lead them to the results mm -hmm. and a buddy doesn't lead a buddy just kind of hangs out so if i know other avenues other services other products that my prospect is looking at to solve their problem i can show how my product or service differentiates from that Welcome to The Takeover with Tim and Cindy, where we show you how to dominate every area of life and business. Let's get winning. Welcome back to The Takeover with Tim and Cindy. In today's episode, we are going to walk through five sales truths to never get rejected on a sales call again. If you run a sales team, if you are an entrepreneur, maybe you're a salesperson, these five sales truths are going to be fundamental and are going to serve as a game changer to not only accelerate your sales, but accelerate your revenue as a result. Sales is the lifeblood of any business. So lock into these five sales truths as we dissect each and every one of them in this episode. Tim, what is sales truth number one? So as we go into these sales truths, I just want to make sure a lot of the things I'm going to say from the exterior might sound like, oh, I've heard that before. What's really important is that you don't just check out when you hear something that sounds similar to what you've heard before, because I promise you the what works really freaking well on the surface without you having an open ear may sound similar to common sales philosophies that have been taught and kind of worn out over the, you know, the last decades or whatever. So truth number one is that great salespeople ask great questions. I'm gonna ask you a great question. What is more powerful and holds more weight to you, Cindy, if I make statements and tell you things, hey, Cindy, this is a really good fit for you. It's a really good program for you. Or if you tell me, Tim, I think this is a good program for me. Hey, Tim, I really like your program. What holds more weight for the prospect when I make a statement to you or when you make a statement to me? If I'm the prospect, yeah. it holds more weight if I make the statement. Correct. And so the things that we say and believe hold way more weight than what a <laughs> salesperson says to us. So great questions are designed to get prospects to make statements to you about the problem, about um, how long the problem has been going on, about the implications if they don't fix their problem, as well as the statements about what they like about your product and your program. So great questions are all designed to get the prospects to make statements to you versus you making statements. Sometimes people think that it's just the gift of gab, somebody who can really talk somebody into something. No, I don't, I don't want to talk somebody into something, some, something. I want to be able to ask questions that get the prospect to have to talk themselves into what we have mm, so good so good so with this first sales truth the focus is on how can you ask great questions on a call that make the prospect come to certain conclusions versus you telling them so it's actually about listening more and speaking less no i, I totally agree so let's go into sales truth number two truth number two is that if there's no problem there's no sell mm. A lot of times we want to show people how cool our thing is and they might even think our thing's cool and they get to the end of the sales call and they go, wow, I love your thing. It's awesome. And you go, well, here's how much it costs for the thing. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Send me a proposal. And they don't sign up because yes, they thought your thing was cool, but they didn't make the connection to see your thing as the absolute solution to fix your problem. So the number one goal on a, on a sales call, if I'm doing questions and discovery, is I want to figure out the full extent of the problem that I'm, I'm going to be helping this person solve. I want to figure out the impact this problem is having on their lives. And then when I go to pitch 
my service, I position my service not as the coolest thing. I position my pitch and my offer as the clear solution and easiest path to solve that prospect's problem. And if I use truth number one, which is ask questions to get them to make statements, I'm going to be having them tell me why this is the best solution to fix their problem throughout the pitch. I think the default for a lot of people is to go into a sales call wanting to just pitch, wanting to show how great their product or service is. Yep. And with this sales truth that if there's no problem, there's no sale, people don't buy because something's like nice to have. They buy it because they need to have it to solve a problem. And if we haven't done the right steps or asked the right questions to uncover what the problem is for the prospect, why they are even on this call, and even better to link that problem to our solution, we're not gonna have a sale. So always remember, ladies and gents, no problem, no sale. Tim, what is sales truth number three? Truth number three is fight for their success, not the sell. And then this becomes more of a mindset position where if you truly believe that your product, your service will help this person solve that problem, then it is your ethical duty to see that you being willing to go the distance on the call is for their good. Mm -hmm. And when I'm focused on for their good, AKA fighting for their success, then I am not getting rejected. If, if they're being resistant, what I'm doing is I'm fighting for their success. And even if they have mental blocks, they have limiting beliefs, they're scared, they're afraid, all of that, they're not rejecting me. Mm -hmm. They didn't get on this call because they don't want their problem solved. Mm -hmm. So the way that I'm looking at this is I'm fighting for their success and yes, there's going, they're going to say no, and they're going to be scared. And they're going to say, I want to think about it because guess what? If they've had this problem for two years and they've hired other companies to solve this problem, they didn't fulfill on the promise. Guess what? They're going to think, what if this happens again? What if I get burned again? What if I get ripped off again? So yes, of course that person's going to be scared. Of course they're going to be gun shy. If a dog's been beaten for the last two years, of course it's going to bark at you, you know? So you have to be willing to fight for their success and not to sell. And I promise you when you're mm. able to, from a moral ethical standpoint, mentally see yourself as fighting for their success and realizing they're probably going to say no. They're probably going to be afraid. They're probably going to want to think about it. They're probably going to want to delay taking action, mm. but fighting for their success. I know that the data shows that the more delay somebody puts into making a decision, the less likely they will be to solve that problem and be successful. Mm -hmm. the, the, the studies show that successful people are very good at making quick decisions without having all the information. So knowing that to be true for my prospect to be successful, I want to be able to help them make that decision quickly on the call and therefore be doing habits and patterns of what other successful people are doing. So I'm fighting for their success, not the sell. And yes, I will get more sales when I fight for their success, but I'm focusing on objection handling, going the distance, staying on the phone is about their success, not about me just making money. I love that. Can you also mention, I think part of this too is why it's not the best option and why you actually shouldn't let a prospect off the call without making a decision because we've heard it so many times we work personally with coaches consultants online service providers marketing agencies and we hear it all the time where somebody will get on a call have an amazing call with the prospect and then let them off the call and send them a proposal if we are really focusing on the sales truths why is this not a good way to go so what you're doing and, and studies have shown that the best time to make a decision is when you have the most amount of information and resources in front of you. And when you are on the phone with somebody who has the source of those information and resources, you can have every single question answered. So good decision-making actually happens when you have the right resources in front of you, which is on the call. The second part is going to be that um, if you send a proposal to somebody, this let's just walk through this way. This person has a problem for two years they can't solve. They've tried it themselves. They've hired other people. They've not been able to solve this problem. Whatever decision-making, whatever 
uh, processes, whatever way they've thought through trying to fix this problem, it has not worked. Mm -hmm. Their way of thinking about the solution to this problem has failed. Yeah. And so if they go, I want to think about it, AKA go back to my old decision making process to solve this old problem I've not been able to solve. You are now letting them take control to solve a problem and you're leaving the cell up to them to make the right decision on something on a problem they have not been able to make the right decision on for the past two years. Mm. So the reason why it is failing them is that you are allowing this person that you know you can help go try to solve the, the, the problem they haven't been able to solve by themselves mm -hmm. versus helping them fighting for their success, fighting for their success mm -hmm. and helping them look at this old problem through a new lens. And that's what great objection handling is. It is asking questions. It's holding them accountable to the, the things they said they wanted on the call. Mm -hmm. And it's asking questions and giving them new perspectives on the way to look at this. Great objection handling is not about having one quick one-liner that gets them to say, oh, wow, you're, you're exactly right. It's introducing new information, new ways to look at this problem that then make them go, you're right. Mm -hmm. huh, I'd, I'd never thought about it that way before, right? So, so great objection handling is you're using questions and you're, you're, you're using statements that get them to look at this old problem from a new lens because until they start looking at the old problem from a new vantage point they're going to keep making decisions the old way and keep getting what kind of results the same the old same. results yeah yep. yeah so good what is sales truth number four number four is be the boss not the buddy i see this mistake happen a lot of times too is people are trying to be friendly they're trying to be the buddy um, but we don't go to the buddy to get our big problem solved. Mm, mm -hmm. We go to experts. Yes. I want so an good. expert. I don't even have to be friends with, with the guy or girl. Mm -hmm. I just need to know that they have leadership and they have the ability to solve this problem. Yes. Too often people think if I can just make friends with this person, then I'm going to get the sell. And, and the fact is, is you don't have to be friends. If I'm on a sales call, number one thing that I want to do is I want to establish the fact that I am an expert at what I do, mm -hmm. that I am the leader in this conversation. Remember, they've had this problem for two years and they haven't been able to solve it. They haven't been able to lead themselves to the result then I need to be able to lead them to the result. Mm -hmm. And a buddy doesn't lead, a buddy just kind of hangs out, Yeah. right? So, but a boss can lead. A boss can say, hey, you've had that problem two years. Yep, I see this all the time, very common. We've worked with 700 clients and fixed this. We wanna position ourselves, and this is gonna be done through tonality. Mm -hmm. So we think of tonality when I'm talking, if, if I'm going, hey, how are you doing today? Like if I'm doing, like it almost sounds like a question, everything I say, well, how's your day going? Oh, hey, what's your name? Like if I'm doing almost like a question mark at the end of every question I, or statement or question I have, it shows uncertainty because I'm, I'm like asking a question, right? And so it makes me feel uncertain. It makes me feel like I'm seeking their approval or I'm just trying to be their buddy. Whereas tonality downward, if I go, hey, it's nice to meet you. Where are you calling in from? You see where I'm going down? Because my tonality is going down, it shows my certainty mm -hmm. versus up, which is like a question. It shows I'm uncertain. I'm seeking their approval. So tonality as well as I think it's really powerful is to be comfortable with silence what happens when you're listening to somebody and there's a little bit of a silence and you're kind of like what are they going to say next yes. what do you do with your, your you you lean, you lean in, in. Mm -hmm. you lean in what happens when somebody's talking 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 you say one thing and they respond back quick it's like you're kind of like okay dude back off so tonality and then being able to have be comfortable with silence especially when you ask a really good question and you want them to kind of think about it or if they ask you a question and you go hmm Cindy that what are you doing right now you're kind of wondering what am I thinking what mm -hmm. am I going to say mm -hmm. so we want to use 
pausing. We want to use active listening and thinking to just be comfortable with that gap. And guess what? If I'm a boss, I don't need to fill all the space. Yeah, that's so good. Right? I'm confident. Uh, and so, and the third part would be like if you're on a Zoom call or in person is body language that's more comfortable, uh, more relaxed, less leaning in. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, so I just want to be comfortable. If you kind of think, I think I say it like this. If you watch any of like a movie where there's like that mob boss mm-hmm. and everybody like he's, he doesn't say much, he doesn't do much. But everybody around him is like knows he's the boss or mm-hmm. she's the boss. And and he's almost like his body language, his tonality, everything he says, people lean into him. Yes. And so think about uh, an easy way to do this and exercise for anybody listening is think about a character from a movie uh, or, or it could be an athlete or it could be just somebody that you know in your life or anybody that has that kind of um, ability to be the leader and ma- have people magnetize towards them, very calm, mm-hmm. confident, and certain. And then you can like literally just show up. It's a kind of a little trick to speed up your, your ability to do this is imagine yourself as that person, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, you know, Dwayne Johnson or it's like Batman or <laughs> they actually yeah. did a, they did a research with a bunch of little kids where, uh, they said, Hey, you know, solve this problem they sent him into this room to solve the problem and the other group of kids they said hey you act like you're batman and wonder woman and then the kids that that were told you're batman and wonder woman did a much better job at solving the problem because they they asked one of the kids oh well hey you seem so calm were you solving that problem and you did such a good job solving it well what were you thinking he's like well batman never stresses out mm-hmm. right and so just you can also do that. It's kind of, it's called an alter ego. It allows you to kind of step into that uh, leadership role a yeah, lot more. So good. I think those keys are so powerful, especially if you are naturally not the type of person that shows up maybe as the quote unquote leader and you are used to being very friendly. People gravitate towards you because you are friendly and you have that rapport naturally with people. Don't assume that that rapport is going to translate into sales correct that rapport is going to translate into making friends and you know as to mention the buddies but we're here to be the boss because the boss is going to lead the person to solving the problem and that's going to get you more sales versus rejections yes 100 percent. what is sales truth number five number five is you have to differentiate from former attempts they've had and considerations that they're looking into what I mean by that is, let's say you are you have a social media marketing company and they've tried social media before it didn't work. I want to probe into that experience. What happened there? What did you like? What did you not like? Why do you think it failed? What were you promised? What actually happened? I want to get a feel and an understanding for what happened there. Because when I go pitch, If I sound like that last thing sounded like what they were promised in the last thing, what do you think they're going to think when I go pitch my thing? They're going to think it's exactly the same and you're going to get rejected. Sounds like what I tried before. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. However, if I know what they tried, what was promised versus like what actually happened, like I know all these details. Now I can say, hey, you know how you how that person said you've got to do X amount of posts in this period, time period. Yeah. That's the reason why this didn't work for you. Hmm. And they're like, Oh, you're, you're almost explaining why it didn't work. And now you're going, so here, what we do is we do our strategy like this. Mm-hmm. That's how so, it's different. So that you get an outcome. So now we're differentiating from what they had tried before. So good. Now on the, what I would call consideration. So attempts is what they've tried in the past and considerations are the other things they're considering, right? I might also contrast, maybe say they're looking at a paid ads and I do organic, right? Something like that where, and, and I might say, Hey, the nice thing about this is when you're doing organic is you don't have to spend money on ads. So when you go to scale this thing, your profit margins are, are a lot better versus with ads, your, your cost is going to be about four or five times as much to acquire a client, something along these lines. So now, um, I'm showing them the benefit of what I do versus what they've tried before and what they're considering so that I want to, at the same time of making my offer look like the solution to 
their problem, I also want to subtly, by using contrast, show that the other solutions out there are not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's the big thing is I want to make sure I'm differentiated from other attempts and considerations. Yeah. So considerations can be boiled down to other things that they're looking at to solve the problem. Yep. So if I know other avenues, other services, other products that my prospect is looking at to solve their problem, I can show how my product or service differentiates from that or how those other services probably won't solve their issue. If you can differentiate from their attempts in the past and their current considerations, the other solutions that are, they're considering right now, if you can differentiate in a way that it's like a light bulb where they go, oh, I see how this will solve my problem better than the things I tried before and is superior to the th other things I'm considering, you will get to sell. So good. So these were the five sales truths to never get rejected on a sales call again. We hope that through these five truths, you not only were enlightened to potentially some areas in your sales calls or sales process that you are missing out on a lot of opportunities. We also hope that as you are moving into more sales calls and as you're moving through your sales processes, that these sales truths will allow you to sell more and close more. If you're listening to this on audio, make sure to follow the show wherever you're listening. If you got a lot of value from this and you thought it was awesome, make sure to give it that five-star rating. Make sure to go in there and give it a rating. If you thought this was horrible and the worst show you've ever heard, then I, I don't know what you're doing listening, but you know, definitely don't rate it or at least let us know how we can make it better for you. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to click that subscribe button. How's it go? You know, you know, they always yep. make that noise, yep. right? So give it that subscribe and then go down to the comments. Start a conversation in the comments. We'd love to hear from you and, and see what, what other resources we can help you out with. Again, this is Tim and Cindy with The Takeover. Stay winning.